North and South Poles, two of the most feared and hostile regions known to man. This is harsh, cold reality. If you don't respect it, if you're not realistic, you kill yourself here very easily. Everybody who comes is immediately humbled just by standing here, the, the size of the mountains. 2002, one man set out to defy logic and to attempt to do what some thought impossible and others knew was crazy. To fly all the way from the North Pole right around the globe to the South Pole using a tiny helicopter. It was a trip that would cost him dearly. A trip that would push him to the very limits of survival. And he said, uh, are we going to die now? And uh, I thought about it for a minute and said, no, their job is to find us. Our job is to live. Patagonia in Chile is a wet, cold, windy place. The Chilean port of Punta Arenas looks south across the Magellan Straits towards the distant continent of Antarctica. Into this foreboding landscape flew a tiny R-44 helicopter, the aviation equivalent of a small family car. A helicopter that was trying to fly its way into the record books. At the controls, adventurer pilot Steve Brooks. Brooks is a self-made millionaire and businessman, and he believes in living his life to the full. Life's a learning curve, and it's a game, and it's fun, and the fun is only there when the learning curve's there. And going and doing things that no one's ever done before are probably as steep as you can get. It, you really are wide awake. You know you're alive. Brooks was trying to fulfill an ambition to be the first person to fly pole to pole by helicopter, and it was never going to be easy. The reason no one had done the polar flights was because it is an exceedingly dangerous, exceedingly difficult task. So difficult, in fact, that he knew he could never take on a challenge of this scale alone. So he brought in an experienced expedition pilot. When it comes to this sort of flying, Quentin Smith, or Q as he's known, is the best there is. I, I fly helicopters. I love helicopters. The helicopter gives you the greatest freedom to move in the biggest medium we've got. The sky touches everywhere without a single barrier. With Q's flying skills, the pair successfully flew the tiny helicopter from Anchorage in Alaska to the North Pole. A flight of 6,000 miles through some very hostile flying conditions. 90 on air. Top of the world. But in their euphoria, the pair had no sense of what lay ahead for them. So here we are, celebrating our arrival at the pole. We've got a little uh, champagne on ice. <laughs> <laughs> After spending the night at the North Pole, the pair took off and turned the helicopter south and began the long flight down the globe, heading for the South Pole. Part of the way through this epic voyage, Steve swapped co-pilots, and he was joined by his photographer wife, Joanna. Joe is also a qualified helicopter pilot, and together, husband and wife flew a staggering 15,000 miles down through the length of the Americas, heading for the southern tip of Chile. That is the mouth of the Amazon. In what is one of the longest flights ever made by such a small helicopter. For miles and miles over endless jungle. Amazing. Something really went wrong. There's just nothing out there. Just thick, thick forest. It was an experience that neither of them would ever forget. People often think of flying about, well, yeah, well, I fly quite a lot. I've been on a jet. And you get, take, get in a jet and you go to 36,000 feet and you really have no concept of what's below you at 36,000 feet. As, as where we're flying at 3.6 feet. And uh, so we can literally be our skids just off the ground at 100 miles an hour. What we actually did, we crossed, I think it was 18 international borders in all, which is an amazing thing to have done. 
Now, after three months, Steve and Joe had arrived in Punta Arenas on the southern tip of the American continent, and Brooke's dream of getting from pole to pole was looking good. Joe headed back to the UK, and Q rejoined Steve, because from here, the flying was going to become even more challenging. But what none of them knew was that in only a few weeks' time, Joe would be their lifeline to survival. Now Steve and Q were ready to take on the most dangerous part of the pole to pole expedition, the flight from Chile to Antarctica, which meant flying across the notorious Drake Passage. The Drake Passage is the 600 mile stretch of water that separates Antarctica from South America. This is the most dangerous stretch of water on the planet, and over the last 500 years, hundreds of ships have been wrecked in its treacherous waters. Ian Shaw is an Antarctic guide. He knows the Drake well. The Drake Passage is simply the meanest piece of sea on the planet. Huge weather systems build up in a westerly fashion around the huge open sea that is around Antarctica. And all that weather is just funneled right through there. I've seen nothing but 30 meter waves to the horizon, one after the other, rolling, 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 as well as winds in excess of 200 kilometers an hour. Back in the UK, the helicopter industry had been watching the record attempt with interest. They believed that Brooks had made a mistake choosing a small single-engine helicopter like the R44 to make such a challenging flight in. I was in. surprised, shocked, and quite sort of um, worried for them, really. I thought it was a bit like trying to take a small Ford hatchback to the Antarctic. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of comparable model. It's that nice family car that you can hardly believe will be taken somewhere quite so adventurous and exotic. But Steve and Q were convinced that the R44 was the machine for the job. After all, it had flown from the North Pole with no problems. But now they were facing their greatest challenge yet. No one had ever crossed the Drake in any kind of helicopter. But many felt that to attempt the crossing with only one engine was risky, to say the least. Most people would actually prefer to go over water in a twin engine. I, mean, I know a lot of people who won't cross the English Channel because they think that's too scary. So, you know, this is a considerably bigger piece of water. So, single engine was a strange choice. And the Chilean aviation authorities agree. They've sent a fax to Punta Arenas Airport denying them clearance for the flight. We've got some big problems. It's our last major problem is to get our permission to fly across the Drake Passage. And in a single engine machine, that's not an easy permission to get. It looked as if Brooks's pole-to-pole -pole record attempt had just been cut short by South American bureaucracy. For Brooks, it's a bitter disappointment. Adventurer pilot Steve Brooks is trying to be the first to fly from pole to pole by helicopter. On the 5th of January 2003, the Chilean aviation authorities relented and gave him and his co-pilot, Quentin Smith, permission to fly their single-engine helicopter across the fearsome Drake Passage. The water's very cold and we probably won't survive for more than about a minute in the water without these survival suits. And these can buy us, uh, they can quadruple the amount of time we live. So we can live for four minutes instead. It's time for the off and here's the dinghy, which I hope we won't need. This was Brooke's big moment. Crossing the Drake was the biggest challenge that he and Q had faced so far, but it was also the biggest risk. It was a beautiful evening. We took off, we got great tailwinds. We had about 130 knot ground speed, which is about 150 miles an hour. Uh, we had a satellite phone on board, so we were doing regular half hour calls, uh, reporting our position, and I rang Joe. He phoned halfway over the Drake Passage, just to say what a beautiful evening it was and how amazing it was to be there. But she said, that's very great, but uh, please ring when we get to the other side. <laughs> so I kind of walked around with two phones you know, wondering how long it would take him to get to the other side, and then eventually went to bed, taking both the phones with me. After three hours, things were going well, and the tiny helicopter powered its way across the icy water. 
20 minutes out from Smith Island and I uh, just said to Q, wow, look, beyond there you can see the mountains of Antarctica in the background and we can see the sun reflecting off the top of these beautiful mountains. Suddenly Antarctica was in our grasp. There was suddenly a rattle in the engine that both Q and I immediately picked up on. We looked at each other and said, what's that? And both of us just had an instant gut feeling that something wasn't right. Q said, I don't know, but I'm having to drop power. It's so bizarre, but it's what's happening. I said to Q, we got 36 miles, and he said, I don't think I'm going to be able to hold it for 36 miles. And then the rattle got stronger and stronger. Suddenly, the oil pressure gauge just did a cool, slow sweep. It went from high pressure to zero. And then suddenly, Boom! Silence. We were at about 700 feet, but both he and I knew very well that in the next 15 or 17 seconds we were going to be in the ocean below us. Hugh flying the helicopter beautifully with the tailwind behind him, getting a nice steady speed and a steady glide. And while he was doing that, he was putting the EPIRB into his survival suit. Time slows down. We've got 20 seconds. Ditching is a pilot's worst nightmare, because unlike aeroplanes, helicopters don't float. The rule book requires that you stay in the helicopter until it goes underwater and then swim out. But Brooks and Smith knew that in the freezing Drake Passage, that meant certain death. So they developed their own ditching procedures. They were going to jump. Steve took the dinghy. He got out and stood on the skid totally alternative way of doing a ditching. For Brooks, timing was critical. They were still flying at 80 miles an hour and were 100 feet over the sea. And I shout, not yet! Like this across the aircraft. And, uh, and on my third not yet, he jumped. And it's the logical assumption to make that he's dead. He's got to be dead. It's like being hit by sledgehammers. Our survival suits, because of the design of them, had fixed hoods. And when the hood's are down, the neck is completely unsealed. Uh, we had to have the hoods down because that was the only way we could get our headsets on. I remember jumping in and hitting the water and the shock. This water gushed inside the survival suit. And I remember um, coming up and seeing the helicopter coming down and touching down towards the water. As the R-44 touched the surface of the water, Q managed to bail out of the doomed helicopter. You bob to the surface, and you're there. <sighs> Amazingly cold. Incredibly, both pilots had escaped the ditching, but as Brooks swam for the life raft, Q was in trouble. I can't swim. I'm looking at this hundred meters of swimming I have to do. Knowing I perfectly well I can't swim a hundred meters. I certainly can't swim a hundred meters with a survival suit full of water. Absolutely frozen. But adrenaline kicked in and he began to claw his way towards the raft. And before long, both pilots were out of the freezing sea. But their nightmare had only just begun. We were both in the life raft, which was full of water and didn't have a roof. Uh, but at least we were floating, and we felt that we'd made a big step forward. So the first thing to do was let somebody know we were alive. So we set about making some uh, satellite phone calls. And then at that point, a wave came over, and um, the lights went out on the phone, and then came back on again. And I remember thinking, I've only got a couple of set a couple of minutes left on this. Not many, not many options. And so I thought, who do I know who will handle this? So I rang Joe. So at three o'clock in the morning, my phone rang, and it was Steve, who literally said, get pen and paper, um, you know, two pilots down, 35 miles north of Smith Island, urgent help needed. And then the phone went completely dead. And at that point, another wave came over, and the lights just died on the phone, and that was the end of the phone. We had no more contact with the outside world. 
Well, it was a very defining moment um, at that moment. The ph phone went out and uh, Q was sitting opposite me in the life raft and his eyes were quite, quite large for obvious reasons. And uh, he said very calmly, very professionally, he's very good in these situations, Q, and he said, uh, are we going to die now? And uh, I thought about it for a minute and said, no, their job is to find us. Our job is to live. Stranded 30 miles off the coast of Antarctica, Stephen Q's chances of survival seemed slim, but today's technology gave them one last chance. From the moment they ditched, their emergency beacon had been transmitting a distress signal, and this had been picked up by the UK Aeronautical Research Coordination Centre in Scotland. Then my mobile phone rang, and it was RAF Kinloss who had received an emergency distress signal which had been set off. Um, about 40 miles off the coast of Antarctica. Um, and they were literally just confirming that, you know, whether it was Steve or whose it was and whether, it was, you know, whether I'd heard anything. A major search and rescue operation swung into action in the Southern Ocean with the ships and planes from the Chilean Navy. But Steve and Q knew nothing of this. They were fighting to stay alive in a raft that was constantly filling with freezing water. the wave hit, you try and limit the amount of freezing cold, fresh seawater coming through. Um, but you couldn't stop it because it wasn't sealed at all. And each time the wave came, suddenly the water level would go up. Although the pair were no longer in the sea, the water in the raft and the water that was still in their survival suits were starting to lower their body temperatures to a dangerous level. Steve and Q were getting close to the limits of survival. Could feel nothing from the waist down in our bodies. And then the body went to the next level and said, look, you're going to die shortly, so, and you're not using your legs, so we'll cut them off. And you're just aware that your body cuts the circulation off to your legs. You don't need it. You need the heat here. You need it right in the core, and you don't need it elsewhere. It's cold. My whole definition of cold has entirely changed. And at five hours, we finally started to relax. And relaxing is dangerous. Because relaxing is like going to sleep and never waking up. You want to go to sleep. After about seven hours, Q, Q claimed that uh, he was getting very hot and started taking his uh, hood and his gloves off. Um, which uh, we had a, a bit of an argument about at the time because uh, he felt he was hot. Um, I felt that it was the first stages of hypothermia. Although Steve and Q had survived the initial crash against the odds, as the hours passed, their chances of being found alive were slipping away. Joe had sent a fax to me just, just before we left saying good luck on the Drake Passage and keep an eye out for the wandering albatross. And uh, right from the moment we crashed, a huge albatross, which is one of the biggest birds in the world, picked up our life raft and was flying just above it and stayed with us for the whole time we were in the life raft. And uh, that also gave a lot of clarity of thought, just knowing that this huge bird was with us. Legend has it that the albatross is a bringer of good luck, and good luck was something Brooks and Smith were in dire need of. Then they heard something. I suppose it was after about um, six or seven hours that we heard an aeroplane um, and we, that was in a search pattern looking for us. We hear a sound of an aircraft, very faint. So I loaded the flare gun and uh, waiting for the plane. I saw it, I could hear it doing a pass, and, uh, but I still couldn't quite see it through the clouds. I didn't want to waste the flare. So I thought, well, I'll wait until it turns and does its next pass. Uh, but to my astonishment, it didn't do a next pass. It just flew away. And um, that was, a, that was a, a low moment. And I just remember looking at the sky and uh, just thinking, trying to talk to the pilot, saying, you know, you're going to come back. I don't rush, but you're going to come right over the top of this life raft. Just 
just total positive thought, you are gonna come right over the top. And um, it must have been about 40 minutes later that we heard a noise and sure enough, the airplane appeared out of nowhere and flew right over the top of the raft. Against all the odds, Steve and Q had been spotted by a Chilean Twin Otter aircraft that was searching for them, and there was a Chilean icebreaker nearby. We heard a foghorn. The most warming sound. It was like, my God, it's, that can't be that far away. After 10 hours in a life raft, Steve and Q were finally rescued by the Chilean Navy icebreaker, the Almirante Vale. They came down and uh, took Q up, put him in a sling and took him up onto the deck. They dumped me in this red hot bath. The nerves were still dead in the legs. They were still dead for three months afterwards. Stephen Q had survived some of the worst conditions on earth. And although grateful to be rescued, Steve watched in frustration as the coast of the Antarctic continent he'd tried so hard to reach slipped away from him. Before long, Stephen Q's ordeal was over. They were back in the UK with a chance to reflect on the disaster. I thought it would become clear over time what had happened, but uh, in actual fact it hasn't come any clearer. It was clear that it was a catastrophic engine failure, but why uh, we have not got to the bottom of. <laughs> For the next year and a half, Brooks settled back into family life in London. But gradually, the sense of frustration at a failed mission became unbearable. In 2003, to the consternation of his wife, Steve made a dramatic announcement. He was going to try again. It was a calculated, thought-out thing that, that really, this is, this should be an acceptable risk level. This is doable. Up to nine, Sierra Bravo, two zero miles east. Okay, Sierra Bravo. Early January 2004, in the Argentinian port of Ushuaia, an adventurous Steve Brooks and expedition pilot Quentin Smith were ready to try again to complete their pole to pole record attempt by flying a small helicopter across the Drake Passage, the stretch of water that nearly killed them two years before. We need to conquer this, we need to do it and do it right and make it work to move forward in life. And that's what expedition is all about. It's the failure's not falling down, failure's not not getting up again. This time, Brooks has got a newer, more powerful R44 helicopter, but it's still only got one engine. Clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff. So we are away. This is an exciting day, really. This is our big one. Just beautiful, beautiful scenery. Do some breakfast. This is our first big one of many, I think. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's a lot more on this. Steve and Q are in good spirits. But the fun doesn't last. Before they left, Steve That's and Hugh had been given a very good weather forecast, and they were looking forward to a clear crossing. Yep. But the Drake Passage can be very unpredictable. They notice a band of cloud has materialised right over their flight path. The question is, when we get halfway across the Drake, we're going to be going under that. The question is, how is the weather going to be? The Drake Passage is 500 miles wide and at the limit of the R44's fuel range. The biggest danger for Steve and Q would be hitting bad weather after they've reached the halfway point, the point of no return. But they trust their weather forecast. So we're now uh, about 180 miles out and uh, this is the bit that we knew was out here. So we're coming down in height to come underneath. We're still not yet halfway. So we're still not past our point of no return. Bad weather on the Drake 
can mean low temperatures and freezing fog, a deadly combination for a helicopter which can quickly ice up and lose its ability to fly. How are we for temperature on freezing? We're good with five, outside air temperature five. I don't think that looks very attractive to you. What do you reckon? Well, it's a uh, cloud down to the ground over the sea. We're 240 miles out. We're at 30 feet. And we're slowing slightly to 80 knots. 200 miles into the Drake Passage, and things aren't going to plan. Temperature's too low. The weather's still tricky. Suddenly, the outside air temperature drops dramatically. They're starting to ice up. Uh, our temperature's dropped to 31. Yeah, that's a shame. This is quite stressful. The temperature, which is completely not forecast, has dropped to below zero. The browns, the clouds down to the ground. We've got a real-time weather check. We know the other side of this. The weather's very good. It's just a question of how much further we've got to go to push through this. We just can't afford to, for it to get any colder. We're watching the droplets on the skids and you can see them just starting to form ice, which is uh, pretty nerve-wracking. Well, we are pointing past the point of return. OK. Hugh, it's your call on the safest option. What do you think the yeah, safest well, option Yeah, well, I'm is? just giving it a few seconds of consideration. I don't think we can go through this fog. Well, we'll stay low and see what happens. OK. I don't think we've got any choice. We knew that the weather on the other side of the front was good. It was just a question of getting through this period. It's a question of whether we could get through the next 60 or 70 miles fast enough without picking up too much ice. This fog is uh, doing us no favours at all from an icing point of view. We really need to be breaking out of it. Things are critical. Getting quite low now from time to time. down to 10 feet in some places with the, where the waves are. The helicopter has started to take on ice. If they take on too much, they'll be forced to ditch a second time. But they've reached the exact point where they nearly lost their lives in the previous attempt, and it's an important psychological marker. But the weather in the Drake proves as fickle Something's as ever. Gotta be happening. It changes yet again, only this time, it's for the best. We're experiencing a short break in the bad news. The temperature's just gone positive again, just at 32 Fahrenheit, and uh, and there's less moisture content. The cloud base has lifted. The temperatures come up, and we are now presented with our first view of Antarctica proper. Look at these icebergs. A couple of hundred feet high. These things. Look at the, the water, the wave action, the wave action through the middle between these two icebergs. I think the gap's closing. The gap probably is closing. You, you wouldn't want it to close too quickly on you, would you? Well, there's King George Island in sight. The gap, we've got uh, seven miles to run. Five minutes. They finally made it. January the 10th, 2005. Exhausted but euphoric. Stephen Q finally landed in Antarctica. Well done, mate. <laughs> it's taken us a while, but yeah, <laughs> we've got there. Right? It, it is, it's quite a tough crossing, but it's nice to be here. Cool. Fantastic. Bienvenido. Although this is a great victory for them in terms of their expedition, they still have to fly two and a half thousand miles into the middle of what is one of the world's largest and most spectacular continents. The continent of Antarctica sits at the very bottom of our planet. It's the continent that we know the least about. It's bigger than Australia and one and a half times the size of the USA. So, after a lot of planning, a lot of work, here we have mainland of Antarctica. Antarctica is uh, the last place on Earth. It's the seventh continent. The only people that live there are scientists as it were, usually on six month or one year contracts. The summer population is probably about 2,000 people and the winter population probably only 800. For the next few days, Steve and Q pick their way down along the Antarctic Peninsula. 
coastal Antarctica is home to the images of Antarctica that most people are familiar with. It's a land of penguins and seals. But to get to the South Pole, Steve and Q have to leave the coast and head into the heart of the continent. And inland Antarctica is very different to the coast. Once they leave the peninsula, they'll enter the biggest desert on Earth. Less than four inches of rain falls here each year, making it drier than the Sahara and unable to support life of any kind. Nothing lives out here. There are no birds, no animals and no plants. 70% of the world's fresh water is frozen here in thousands of square miles of ice, which gradually builds in thickness until it rises to an incredible 10,000 feet above sea level at the South Pole. From here on, Steve and Q must start their gradual climb to the pole, and this poses a major problem, because the R44 can't reliably take off at 10,000 feet, and that, combined with the incredibly cold temperatures, will make the last leg of this flight very difficult indeed. Steve and Q's next stop will be here. 1,500 miles further south, and at 3,000 feet above sea level, this is the support camp at Patriot Hills. It's run by Antarctic veteran Mike Sharp. We're Sharpen. about 600 miles from the South Pole. We're in continental Antarctica. Patriot Hills is a naturally occurring blue ice area on which we built a runway and we now land a four-engine jet, um, which is an Aleutian 76. The camp exists to provide logistical support for the various Antarctic expeditions both scientific and adventure that come here. Any private individual who comes to inland Antarctica comes through this camp, and Steve and Q are no exception. We're supporting Steve in that we're providing fuel for him, but also we're providing search and rescue coverage uh, at a moment's notice. We're on standby all the time. Over the years, Mike and his team have seen many different expeditions fall foul of the polar weather. He knows what a dangerous place it is to fly in. Antarctica is littered with plane wrecks. All landing, not just the Twin Otter, but the helicopter as well, have to have contrast on the ground. Because the ground is white and the clouds are white and reflecting the light, it's very, very difficult to see what the ground surface is. Understanding the hostile weather will be crucial to their chances of getting to the pole. Steve and Q have now entered inland Antarctica, and before long, they become aware of the insignificance of their tiny helicopter in this dramatic landscape. But as they approach the fuel dump that Mike Sharp's team have left out for them, the weather suddenly changes. They lose all visibility. They've flown into an Antarctic whiteout. Uh, this is the bit we've been uh, dreading. Light's gone now, it's amazing. What's happening? We've got cloud cover above us, we've got snow below us, and the white. Everything's just gone white. It's just terrifying the contrast. We could be two feet above the ground, or we could be 200. It's a situation that Steve and Q are only too familiar with. Two years previously, Jennifer Murray and Colin Bedell were also trying for the pole to pole by helicopter record. And they were flying north from Patriot Hills when they flew into cloud with disastrous consequences. They lost the horizon, they weren't sure of how high they were, uh, they lost visual contact with the ground and they went down to check it out. Uh, they're under quite thick cloud, there's no sunlight at all and uh, they met the ground um, a bit prematurely at 105 knots. For 10 hours and despite terrible injuries, Murray and Bedell managed to hold out against the ferocious Antarctic weather while they prayed for rescue. We put the otter out straight away and Fortunately, about three or four hours later, we were able to get into them with a doctor and a medic to get them out. This is a story that Steve and Q are only too familiar with. Even the most experienced Antarctic pilots don't fly when there's a risk of a whiteout. Your senses tell you one thing, which could be totally opposite of what is actually right. You can turn your aircraft upside down and you think this is the way it has to be done. You lose all senses of uh, perspective can't see the horizon, so the mind just goes numb. What we're going to do is we're going to feel our way. We're going to go step by step 
and as soon as we can't see what we're flying to, then we have to stop and either retrace our way back. God, it's just eerie. So we can't rely on our instruments. We've just got to rely on making sure we don't fly past what we can clearly see. You've just got to fly on visual cues. You've got to keep a sharp eye on what you can see and only fly to what you can see. And it's a completely different ball game than flying. This is just getting so marginal now. I don't think we can go through that at 29. But then I don't think we do very well up there either. But the secret is you mustn't fly when you've got major cloud cover. After 30 minutes of flying blind, Q and Steve are in serious trouble. But then, through the murk, they spot the fuel barrels that are waiting for them. They can use these as a reference. Ten minutes later, they successfully land. That's really difficult. You can't see any features. Even walking along, you're just walking along, suddenly you walk into something. You can't see any detail. Pretty terrifying. We're going to stop and think for a while. Stop and think. Before long, the weather changes again, and Stephen Q can safely fly the last 300 miles to Patriot Hills. Well, we've come to the last holding point on our long journey from the North Pole. We've got 600 miles to go. There is nothing out there between here and the South Pole, and we've got to get our little machine from 3,000 foot, which is where we are now, up to 10,000 foot in altitude, to a temperature of about minus 30. South Pole, South Pole, Patriot Hills. It's two years since they landed in the isolation of the North Pole, and it looks as if their arrival at the South Pole will be a very different experience. All this is construction site. Because the South Pole is host to the Amundsen Scott Research Base, as and it's strictly the controlled by the Americans. There's another building out here. Uh, we have a helicopter wanting to fly to South Pole today. Because it's so difficult and I was to fly just wondering a helicopter if I could perhaps South grab a tech They are something of a rarity. And the US base is surprised. Robinson R44, over. Is that a helicopter or a tornado, over? Uh, helicopter, helicopter. Oh, that's, uh, that's a surprise. Uh, <laughs> They were a bit surprised. Visibility unrestricted. Sky is clear. Success is in Brooks's grasp, but the danger is far from over. Their final flight will take them out over the Antarctic ice cap, where, after climbing 6,000 feet into the Thiels Mountains, they'll have to find their last fuel dump. After refueling, they'll fly the final 300 miles, climbing to the absolute limits of their helicopter's capabilities. Uh, we're going into the unknown territory now. We're going into uh, very high altitudes, very cold weather. Uh, starting is going to be a huge problem for us up there. And uh, the question is whether we've got the ability to do it. exciting moment from now on our view is this a dome of snow that gets thicker and thicker and thicker until finally it gets to a thickness which takes it 10,000 feet above sea level and that's where we'll find the South Pole so we've been flying around over a featureless um, terrain and then look what you find here look at these wonderful crevasses and look at that hole Look, deep blue, that's got some serious that distance that down there. That is what we call a crevasse. Look at the size of that hole. You wouldn't I mean, that want to be in there. Hundreds of feet. What a beautiful place to be. We're on this snow dome. It's just incredible. But four hours into the flight, and Steve and Q are once again in trouble. They're running out of fuel, and even in good light, they can't find the fuel dump. It's basically fairly tense. All we can see is a sea of white. We can see the mountains which mark it. One of the pilots tipped us off on that. We haven't got the fuel to be able to motor around looking for it. So we need to be spotting it now. I got it. I got it. Ah, <laughs> there are our barrels. Out in the middle of nowhere.
In order to refuel at Thiel, Steve and Q have taken a risk. They've shut down the R44's engine. They've already climbed to 6,000 feet above sea level and the air is getting thinner. This, combined with the cold temperatures, mean that starting the helicopter could be difficult. We better get going, because the engine's gonna get cold. That's not firing. Connectors on both. The problem here, we've stopped on the snow and it's not starting. That was a nervous <laughs> moment. For some reason, it just didn't seem to want to start. The engine's still warm. Another, well, that was another interesting piece of knowledge gained. Steve and Q are nervous. If the R44 is struggling to start at 6,000 feet, when they get to 10,000 feet at the South Pole, they may not start at all. The gateway to the South Pole. So they decide to push on for the pole and use the 24 hours of sunlight to their advantage and fly in and out and back to Thiel without shutting down. But the Americans have other ideas. Steve and Q are flying into a diplomatic incident. Steve Brooks has almost completed his mammoth 27,000 mile flight from North Pole to South Pole. But as his R44 gets to within 100 miles of his goal, he's in for a nasty surprise. Break, break, Mac Ops, Patriot Yules, over. The South Pole have contacted Patrick Hill's radio operator, Jason Whiting, with some bad news. There's been an incident at the pole, and it's closed. Uh, the pole is posted a request to us. Um, due to operation requirements, could we please just delay any visits to the poles. South Pole will contact us as soon as they feel um, their resources are available to meet us. Well, this is an extraordinary situation. They've told us that they're too busy to talk on the radio. They've asked us not to land at the South Pole um, and land five miles short um, and camp there, and uh, we'll have to talk to them tomorrow. So it's the most extraordinary situation. As they follow the tracks of an expedition that skied to the pole, Steve and Q are aware that they're in trouble. If they have to camp five miles from the pole, they'll have to shut their engine down at 10,000 feet and at 25 degrees below freezing. It may not start again. There in the long far distance is the South Pole. There it is, South Pole Base. But they're so close now that they decide to risk the anger of the Americans and to overfly the base. And the big shiny dome looks very pretty. Must be a pretty serious emergency they've got going there. I hope they're okay. Good luck to them. But the American base of Amundsen Scott is unimpressed. Basically, you rang just before you came in, spotted one mile out. Um, if they do land there, the pole will deal with it accordingly. Right. <coughs> oh, oh. Hello, Steve, it's Mike. Um, will you move five miles away from the pole, please? Um, they have uh, indicated great displeasure with your being there. They have a heavy flight schedule. Uh, well, we did, uh, well, we did to speak to her and uh, told, her where, we told her where we were and what we were doing. She said that was fine, don't uh, call her on the radio and we're free to do what we like. OK, well, if, if you would camp five miles, uh, I think everybody would appreciate it, Steve. OK, okay. Understood. understood. OK, give us a call then. Thanks, uh, Steve. Cheers. Bye. So what's just happening? So he's actually, um, they're going to move away. They say they've actually talked to uh, the people at the pole. Just being a fucking kid, really. <laughs> 24 hours later, and the pair have woken to more bad news. The weather's changed again. Well, good morning. It's uh, minus 25 on the pole, and uh, we've just woken up. Uh, good night's sleep. When the sun's out, it's really quite warm, but the sun's gone in now. We've got freezing fog. Everything around us is freezing up, and as you can see, when I talk, it's pretty cold. Um, so we're just going to hang loose here. It's a beautiful building material. Steve and Q think that they may have found a solution to their starting problem, and they've been inspired by the Eskimos. So we had to find some way of getting this helicopter to start. 
We finally came up with a solution, which was just to carry a wood saw. And with a wood saw, you can make an igloo. That's a good cube. Yeah, they're nice. We made an igloo around the base of the helicopter, sealed the whole engine compartment in it. Our cooker was very elegant. It was just a very small liquid fuel burning uh, cooker. We had no idea it would work. We put the cooker in the igloo, left it there for two hours. Uh, it's pretty cold out there, so what we've done is uh, decided to come back inside. We're losing the feeling in our feet, even though we've got amazing boots, um, and our hands from digging in the snow. So we've put the MSR under the helicopter. We're quietly warming the engine. We come in and uh, going to have some water, rehydrate, warm ourselves up, and then go out again. Great fun, though. <laughs> I think that lens is frozen. <laughs> so this thing's been cooking for an hour and a half. We've now got a temperature of zero inside there. So we're going to try and start. It's cold outside, but it's toasty warm in here. <laughs> what do you think, Brixie? So the question is, will it start? These are the temperatures we've got now. A bit touch and go this. It's also very high altitude. Gonna give it a go. First time. First time. No! <laughs> no! Is that running? Yes! That's a brilliant thing! Minus 22, 10,000 feet, starting first time. We're pretty happy about that. It's absolutely very cold here. We've been here for nearly 24 hours, so everything's stone cold, including us. For it to start like that is just unbelievable. Fantastic. We're really pleased. So the weather's just slightly lifting. We're warming the engine. So I think we should be off to the pole. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, 369 Sierra Bravo is uh, an R44 helicopter five miles from you. And, uh... OK, copy. You are inbound. At long last, here it is, we're coming in. This is South Pole, South Pole. Unbelievable, it's so different to what we saw in the North Pole, when the two of us just sat on that little piece of floating ice in the middle of nowhere with no one out there. And this place is just huge by comparison. And this is it, we are landing at the South Pole. <laughs> We've done it. We have got one end of the planet to the other. And so, after two years of anguish, frustration and disaster that nearly costed their lives, the R44 lands at 90 degrees south, the South Pole. <laughs> so here we are, and we've arrived. The first people to fly from pole to pole by helicopter. We started at the North Pole, and this is the South Pole. This has been a remarkable journey, and both Brooks and Smith feel that their determination has paid off. A lot of people thought that we should give up. They thought that when we had uh, the situation we had on the Drake Passage, the answer was to walk away. But uh, Q and I felt that that wasn't the answer. We feel that in life you have to push forward, you have to keep going, and that's what we've done. Not only was it the most beautiful trip, be a beautiful thing to see, but also that it was this unloading of a huge burden, intense, lifetime high feeling of achievement and accomplishment. When I heard that he'd made it to the Polo, I was absolutely delighted for him, and it was a big realization of a dream of his, and something we'd all three of us had set out to do two years earlier. We finally arrived and we've made it work and it's been uh, an amazing journey along the way. We've met some fantastic people and we've ended up in environments like this. It's been a great privilege. <laughs>